All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Momin Wahidi. I'm the president of the ABIP, and I'm pleased to have you all here. This is the uh, uh, first symposium on billing and coding for pulmonary procedures. Uh, we think uh, that it will be a great value for you. Hopefully, you'll uh, get a lot of information. Um, we've assembled a, a panel of faculty, our experts in, in revenue and uh, billing and coding, uh, and we're going to hear from all of them today. I'm going to allow some time for questions and discussions. Uh, uh, I'll remind you that this uh, session is being taped uh, to be uh, available on our website for download. So uh, when we speak, uh, we're going to use the microphones. If you have questions, I'm going to come with the microphone uh, so everybody can hear your question and be taped. Um, I just want to have one disclaimer that uh, what we share with you today can vary depending on your state, city, carrier, insurance, uh, um, you know, location, uh, where you practice. So uh, please uh, ask your revenue manager, business manager to confirm some things. Uh, so things do vary from state to state. So there are principles that are true for, it, for in general, but there are some details that can vary. So if you have any questions, you should always consult your local revenue or business manager. All right. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Scott Maneker. Uh, Scott is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he's also vice chair of clinical affairs for the Department of Medicine and also a physician advisor on coding and billing at the University of Pennsylvania. And Scott really is uh, one of the most um, sort of informed pulmonary physicians on this area. He represents, I think, the pulmonary Societies on the RUC committee? Um, uh, no, no longer. No longer. Because I uh, actually am an AMA appointee to the committee now for the running the practice expense subcommittee, but I used to. Even a higher position. Then. <laughs> yes, Dr. Kovitz. <laughs> so uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Dr. Kovitz, the other speaker, is now the representative. But um, again, Scott has tremendous knowledge and he uh, is going to share with us today. So, Scott? Well, thank you very much, Momin. And I want to thank both Momin and all of you for the invitation to speak tonight. I, I get invited to speak lots of times, lots of different places. But coming to the AABIP to give a talk is like being invited to the Rock Star Hall of Fame. You know, I can take a look at the people here. We have current rock stars, future rock stars. And I know that each and every one of you are going to be moving the field forward. And so when Momin asked me to try and come up with a talk going over the revenue cycle, everything from how we're paid to managing accounts receivable, it's an overwhelming task. What I'm going to try and do in the next 20 or so minutes, allowing some time for questions now, and then of course there'll be questions at the end, is starting very big with some basic principles of healthcare finance. And then we'll narrow down to a couple of bronchoscopies that you all know and love and do all the time. You could do them in your sleep, but I hope you're awake, actually, when you're in the airways tooling around. And what that looks like from the patient's perspective on a bill. And then we'll get large again, multiply that up times thousands of bills, and just look at an example of, of what some uh, uh, monthly reporting might look like. Now, uh, as an introduction, uh, Momin mentioned that I'm, I'm vice chair for our Department of Medicine. I'm a, actually an official advisor to our health system Office of Billing Compliance. I'm on our Medicare Contractor Advisory Committee. I've formerly been on a CMS uh, Federal Advisory Commission, the Hospital Outpatient Panel. I do lots of work for us as a pulmonary community and critical care community and sleep community, as well as for all the medical specialties through the American College of Physicians and, and AMA. So I do a, a lot of this work really advocating as a physician for uh, physicians. I list everything that I've done in the past 15 years uh, in my career as a means of disclosure in this era. Uh, the best thing you can do to manage conflicts of interest is simply have full disclosure. So I put it all up here, including the fact that uh, I'm on the RVU Update Committee, the RUC. Many of you might read about that in the papers. I'm a director of the for-profit subsidiary of CHEST. Uh, I do lots of speaking and review of records. I occasionally consult for the industry, never about revenue. And in fact, the last formal consulting I did was over three uh, years ago for Aetna on some diagnosis 
coding issues for, for their payments. And that brings me to a point I want to emphasize that Momin brought up. Uh, the reason it says opinion's my own and I can't guarantee the accuracy of what I'm going to tell you is because everything I'm going to tell you is basic Medicare. It's in the public domain. We all know it. I actually legally can't tell you about our contracts because that would be collusion. Uh, I'm going to use Medicare as a foundation to try and explain some basics to you, but then I'm going to embellish and give some examples of how you probably do have some of these other contracts that I'll be, be talking about. And when you go home, whether you're a uh, fellow learning interventional pulmonology, thinking about your first job, or you're a division chief, a bronchoscopy lab director as a hospital, running it for the hospital, uh, perhaps running in the entire respiratory service line for your health system, you're going to be needing to be thinking about these issues from multiple perspectives, from the different payer perspectives, the patient perspectives, the provider's perspectives as they're going through and doing procedures trying to take great care of patients. Because we live in a very complicated system. All of us are here sitting today because we love the clinical service. Whether it's reading PFTs or taking care of outpatients, uh, doing critical care, or what you all love to do, interventional pulmonology, lots of bronchoscopies. This is why we went into medicine. This is why we're training. This is why we love going to work every day. I'm not going to talk about that at all. The, the rest of the talk is going to be about this entire other half here of the revenue cycle. Because after we've done our bronchoscopy, we've got to make sure we have all the charges captured. They're entered into whatever billing system. It clears whatever edits so that we can send a bill out. The insurance companies, including Medicare, can decide to pay or reject it. And then we have to figure out which ones did they pay, which ones didn't they pay, and why didn't they pay them? And then it just goes around and around as we continue seeing patients and they keep coming back for more and more services. So I want to compare and contrast for you the multiple different payment systems that every one of us lives in today. I think all of you are familiar that uh, uh, we, the bronchoscopists, get a fee for our services. And then there's a technical fee to the hospital or facility or perhaps even our office for the bronchoscopy that we've been performing. If the patient is in the inpatient hospital, right, they're admitted, they're an inpatient, they're fulfilling the two midnight rule, then that all gets paid under Medicare's Part A under the diagnosis related groups. You may hear about APR DRGs, all payer related DRGs, or MS Medicare medical severity adjusted DRGs. These are slight modifications of the DRG system. This one's used by many commercial payers. This is the technical name for the Medicare DRG system. But they're all variations of the same theme. The patient is assigned to a particular DRG. The hospital gets a payment for that inpatient admission, whether they stay a long time or a short time, use lots of resources, many resources. That's how the hospital gets paid. Everything else that you see on this slide is Medicare Part B. And they're all from different pools of money. So the physician fee schedule, which is paying our fees regardless of where we perform the bronchoscopy as well as the technical portion, if we do a bronchoscopy in our true physician office, gets funded by that pool of dollars where the SGR was eliminated. But remember, it's still a fixed pool of dollars. And if one thing goes up, something else has to go down because it's a fixed pool of dollars. There is a separate pool of dollars that pays ambulatory surgical center. They have several different levels, much like the outpatient hospital system, which is run by ambulatory payment classifications, or APCs. There were about 600 of these. There are about 700 DRGs, different payment rates for the different hospitals. Those of you who practice at academic medical centers, I assure you, when you go to your practice, you are not in a physician's office. Uh, you are in an outpatient hospital clinic or a provider-based billing clinic. Those are all outpatient hospitals. Beginning January 1, Medicare is requiring our institutions to have a separate modifier for whether that clinic is on or off campus, geographically disparate and uh, far from the hospital campus in order to track those different types of payments better. Uh, 
it's very rare for academic practices to actually have a true physician's office. Now you may be saying, who in the world actually performs bronchoscopy in the office setting? Well, one of the references you'll get at the end of the talk is an article about exactly how you go about doing that. And secondly, when I looked at the Medicare claims database for 2014, there were about 1,000 31622s, basic look-see bronchs build from the outpatient office setting. So when people think, oh, must be, a, must be an error, somebody must have put the wrong side of service down, maybe that's true for dozens, maybe that's even true for a couple of hundreds, but I've got to believe that it's not a thousand different errors, and that's just for the Medicare population, who knows, for other payers as well. So in all of these different settings, there's a technical fee and there's a bronchoscopist's professional fee, and you'll hear those words in a lot of different ways by a lot of different people over time. So that basic look-see bronc, the 31622, how much do you get paid for that? Well, if you're the bronchoscopist, you get paid $150, whether it's on an inpatient, whether it's on a hospital outpatient, whether it's done in an ambulatory surgery center, you get 150 bucks. If it's a hospital inpatient, the hospital gets paid nothing for the technical fee. The DRG that they get for a respiratory diagnosis is the DRG that they get. Whether the patient gets zero bronchs, one bronch, or five bronchs, the hospital gets no incremental revenue. And that's why it's increasingly hard to go and do seemingly elective bronchoscopies on an inpatient. Oh, wouldn't it be much more convenient? Wouldn't it be easier for the patient? While they're here getting over their pneumonia, we'll do the bronch that we plan. The hospital doesn't want you doing that because you're adding cost for which they're not getting paid on that inpatient admission. If it's done in the outpatient hospital setting, this basic look-see bronch gets paid $1,000 to the hospital. This is one of two APCs, or ambulatory payment classifications, the 076 is the lower paying one currently. And the hospital gets $1,000 as opposed to an ambulatory surgery center, which is why all of our hospitals set up bronch suites as part of the outpatient hospital, and they don't typically set it up as an ASC. There's more overhead and you have to do more, but it's well worth it for the reimbursement that you get. Whereas if it's done in the office, there is no facility to get any reimbursement, but you as the bronchoscopist get over twofold the reimbursement. Now, why am I spending all of this time emphasizing the different pieces of reimbursement? Because if you want to understand the revenue cycle and you want to understand how much you should get paid and how much you're not being paid inappropriately, you have to really understand all the different pieces of what is going to go on the bill that we're then going to go and analyze for whether or not we're being properly paid. So you get $319 for this, and why? It's because you, as the physician in your office, are bearing all of the technical expenses that Kevin's gonna talk about a little later when he talks in general about the resource-based value system and RVUs, where the payment is a conversion factor multiplied times all the RVUs, there's three buckets of RVUs, malpractice, physician work, and practice expense. And you in the office setting, owning the bronchoscope, cleaning the bronchoscope, paying for the assistance, are bearing all of those expenses, and that's why you get paid $319 instead of $150 if you were just doing the work. Now, how about a transbronchial needle aspirate? Well, believe it or not, there are a few of those that are being done in the offices, or at least being reported to Medicare as being done in the offices. The hospital still gets zero dollars for incremental reimbursement, but this is in the higher paying APC, 415. There's two APCs for bronchoscopy currently, a low and a high. The low one pays 1,000. The high one pays $2,256. It's the Medicare national payment rate. Next year, beginning January 1, this is gonna be divided into three different levels. In the ambulatory surgery center, you would get paid $1,236. You as the bronchoscopist get $211 in all of these settings, except if you're doing it in your office, you now get $600, almost three times the reimbursement because you own the bronchoscope, you're buying the transbronchial needle, you're paying for all the staff to help you do that bronch bronchoscopy. Let's take a little deeper dive and look at a typical procedure or bronchoscopy with ultrasound now guiding the transbronchial needle aspiration. And by the way, we're gonna do a little brush of the airway 
along the way. Because, well, maybe it looks a little abnormal. What's that going to look like? Well, your reimbursements as the physician are going to be $211 for that transbronchial needle aspiration. Because of the multiple endoscopy rule, that brush will pay you the difference, the increment of a basic bronchoscopy for what a brushing would do. If you were just doing a 31623, you just went down, took a look, did a brush, and then went home, you would get paid 200 and, I'm sorry, $151. But for the multiple endoscopy rule, you only get the increment above that $150 basic bronchoscopy. So you're only going to get a dollar. So when you're looking at the bills and trying to figure out how much should I be paid, you should only be paid a dollar. And for using endobronchial ultrasound, you get paid $70 for the professional fee. So you would be paid a total of $272 for this procedure. The hospital would get a full APC payment for the 31629. The 31623 is in the lower APC payment rate of $500. $578. So according to the multiple procedure payment reduction rule, when you do multiple procedures in the same setting, the hospital facility gets 50% of the second through as many as is necessary procedures. So they get half of the 578 is 289. Ultrasound guidance, like electromagnetic navigation guidance and other forms of imaging, is bundled in, the technical term for the hospital outpatient system, which I'm focusing on, because that's the system where the largest number of our bronchoscopies are performed, uh, is considered packaged. That's the technical term, packaging. Because you're not going to be doing endobronchial ultrasound. You're not going to be doing electromagnetic navigation unless you're already doing the baseline bronchoscopy. So they bundle all of those costs into this basic payment, whether or not you're using imaging guidance. And from a payer perspective, that means there's now no financial incentive for you to use imaging guidance or not from the technical side. If the patient needs it, you do it. If the patient doesn't need it, you don't do it. Because these are big dollars where you can have different incentives playing into clinical decision making. Well, I want to emphasize that this would be the appropriate payments to you as the physician and to the hospital uh, uh, as the sponsoring facility providing all of the equipment. The patient is going to be responsible under Medicare for 20% of the total allowable reimbursements, which is just under $3,000 here. The patient copay would be about $567. So if we're going to be talking about the revenue cycle, and how to think about how much we're being paid and analyze how much we're being paid. We not only need to know how much we're supposed to be paid, we need to know how much of it are we supposed to collect from the patient and how much of it are we supposed to collect from the payer, whether it's Medicare or anyone else. If, it, if the patient has a Medigap insurer, the Medigap insurer would be picking up this $567, unless there's a minimum deductible, which we'll talk about in a couple of slides. So here's what the bill would look like for this brushing and transbronchial needle aspiration done in the hospital outpatient facility. Whether you're the patient receiving the bill or you're the primary insured receiving the explanation of benefits, this is what it would look like. You're going to see a whole series of charges, some for the hospital, some for the physician, what the allowables are, what the payment from the payer should be, what the patient's copay should be, and there's something called the contractual adjustments. What are the contractual adjustments? The contractual adjustments are going to be the difference between what you've charged and what the allowable payment is. Recognizing for a bunch of your payers, some of them may be paying you 80% of Medicare. Some of them may be paying you 120% of Medicare. And so these numbers are going to vary based upon what your contract is. Sometimes the patient will get one bill. We at our institution are moving to a single consolidated bill from both the facilities and the doctors. We have a single consolidated group from all 2,000, single consolidated bill from all 2,000 physicians in the practice plan. So you get one bill from the doctors, 
one bill from all of the hospitals, that's now being consolidated into a single bill from everyone. But depending on where you practice, the patient may get two different bills for this single service. One of the things that causes outrage and alarm and eyebrows going up is why are the charges so godforsaken high, right? Typical at most institutions is that it will be two and a half to three times the Medicare allowable charges or reimbursements. And why is that? That's because most institutions have a few or perhaps many different payers where the contracted rate is not a fixed percentage of what Medicare pays, but a fixed percentage of charges, 40% of charges, 60% of charges, 80% of charges, depending on more prevailing market conditions. So that's going to be artifactually increasing the charges that we put into the system. Secondly, some institutions are going to have patients who are legitimately self-insuring. They're going to come in with their medical, medical savings accounts or their credit card, and they're going to say, I'm ready to pay. They don't have a discounted contracted rate. They're going to be paying full charges. As I mentioned before, sometimes the patients have a deductible. They have to pay all the, all the allowables up to $500 or $1,000, or now in the era of all these different um, markets that are available. Uh, some patients have several thousand dollars. Uh, you'll have to adjust that for figuring out which of these dollars need to be shifted into the patient pay column because they haven't met their annual deductible. And although they may have met their deductible early in the year and you're seeing them in the fall, come January 1, clock resets, goes back down to zero, and they have to meet their new deductible for the new calendar year. The last thing I want to point out is this assumes for all of these services, nothing's been denied. And so we'll go through an example of showing you when one of these services is denied. Other things to think about, if it's common reasons for services to be denied, it might not be a covered service. If it's not a covered service, as long as you have the patient sign an advance beneficiary notice ahead of time, the f you can then pass those charges on to the patient and they have to pay those exorbitant full charges that I showed you on the prior slide. On the other hand, if you're denied payment because it's deemed not medically necessary, then you cannot pass those charges on to the patient as their responsibility. Examples of not medically necessary procedures are going to be diagnosis procedure code edits. For example, nobody's going to let you do a bronchoscopy for heme positive stool. Frequency edits. Nobody's going to let you do spirometry and get paid for it on a monthly basis for somebody with asthma. No one's going to allow you to charge a patient if it's an experimental device. And in our field, we've had lots of experimental devices in the past 10 to 15 years, which took a long time before they were deemed non-experimental. We can talk about fractional exhaled nitric oxide. We can talk about bronchial valves. We can talk about bronchial thermoplasty as but several notable examples in our particular field. And then bundling. Many payers will not follow Medicare's rules. Medi many payers will come up with their own bundling rules for what they say, no, 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 this is bundled. You can't have a separate payment. So now let's move in the final few minutes through some of the analyses as we start multiplying this back up. For this particular bill, what's the gross collection rate? Well, if we've charged nine and, a little over $9,500 and we've collected 2262 and 565, that's a gross collection rate of 29%. Sounds terrible. Great way to inflame passions at a cocktail party when you start complaining and whining that, oh, we're only getting paid 29% on the dollar. But you weren't entitled to anything more than 29%, right? So when people complain about their collection rates and say, oh, we have a wonderful collection rate. You know, our collection rate is 70, our gross collection rate is 70, 80 percent. It's probably because their charges aren't high enough and they're leaving some dollars behind. The real metric that you need to look at is the adjusted collection rate, the rate of dollars that you're supposed to be paid. How good are you at collecting those? Well, 
$2,262 is what the payer is paying you, and you got all $565 from the patient, now your adjusted collection rate is 100%. Perfect. It's what you'd like to see. But you have to remember to collect all those patient co-pays, and you've got to go chasing after them. Now, what happens if the service is deemed medically necessary? And I probably don't need to remind the older folks here in the room of when endobronchial ultrasound first came out. Many payers ac across the country said, we're not going to pay you a penny because it's not medically necessary. There isn't enough data. This is not a covered service. It's still experimental. And if it's experimental, they don't have to pay it. So what would this look like? Well, you've already gone and collected all those patient co-pays, so now you have to pay the patient back $14 that you inappropriately collected from them. And your collection rate is now only 98% because you weren't getting those $14 for, nor were you getting the $56 from the payer here for your endobronchial ultrasound. So there's some money left behind. That's the adjust, correct adjusted collection rate for this one example of a denial. Other things to think about, payer-specific bill, billing. If they've got specific bundling rules, you may or may not want to adjust the claims that you are sending out to that particular payer to account for their particular nuances. Uh, you need to be reviewing all those other parts of the revenue cycle. The most common reason claims are denied, that they're not a, quote, clean, end quote, claim, is because you've got registration errors, you've got the wrong birthday, you haven't gone and validated that they changed insurers two months ago, you didn't get an appropriate preauthorization demanded by that particular payer. Remember, the beauty of Medicare is there's no preauths. It's either covered or it's not. Uh, you have to be able to analyze the denials and rejections by cause, focus in on the adjusted collection rates and the days in AR we'll talk about in a couple of slides at the end. And don't, rem don't forget about missing charges. If you only knew how many vaccinations are administered and how many thoracentheses are performed, did people forget to go and write those down and capture those charges and actually bill for them, particularly in the office setting. All right, last couple of slides. We're going to multiply that bill and those analyses by thousands and thousands of bronchoscopies that we all do. And what's that going to look like? Well, remember, on a monthly basis, uh, you're in a non-equilibrium state. Every month, you're sending out new charges, and dollars are coming in for charges that you sent out last month. And so the, it's in flux. And so every month, there'll be a different varying title. It's very important to divide these into different buckets by different payers so you can analyze which payer am I having problems with, which payer do I not seem to be having problems with. You want to be looking at gross charges and expected payments, the allowables, not your gross charges alone, but you also want to focus in on the allowables. And then as the numbers go up and down, you want to separate volume changes where you're doing more bronchoscopies from rate changes where for the same bronchoscopy you seem to be getting more dollars. Is that because the contracted payment rate went up or your payer mix shifted to someone who you have a better contract with? And you want to account for things in the months, for things like holidays, weather when there's snow preventing people from making their appointments for their procedure. In our shop, it was when the Pope came to visit. We had to go and ramp down and cancel every elective procedure and office visit on the Friday and Monday following the Pope's weekend visit. When you're analyzing these large um, uh, groupings of data, an important measure becomes the account receivable days, the days in AR. It's the receivables, the dollars that you're expecting to bring in, divided by a moving average of the receivables. And the goal is to have that number be less than 30 days. You don't want to have more than one, day, one month's worth of charges out there waiting for those dollars to come in. Small practices commonly can get down into the 30s. Large academic practices with billing offices sending out more than a million claims a month like ours strive to get down into the 30s. Ours is actually in, in, has been in the 30s traditionally for the past couple of years. 
Uh, the last couple of slides are just where can you learn to get more information about this because it's a massive, very complicated topic. Uh, the new edition of Coding for Chest Medicine is going to have all the new bronchoscopy codes that are coming out in it. It's a smaller edition because many of the chapters haven't been updated. If you want the chapter on the revenue cycle, the analysis and management of the revenue cycle hasn't changed in the last couple of years, nor has the basics of facility billing. Those two basic chapters are available in the 2013 and several prior editions as well. I've got some references for you, not only the, the coding for chest medicine text, but also Bill Lund wrote a wonderful paper about office-based bronchoscopy now almost a decade ago. Uh, Nick Pastis has a terrific article on understanding the economic impact of a trend of a interventional pulmonary program and how to look at that from a system perspective because if you're a pulmonary fellow going into interventional pulmonology, you're not going to be able to make ends meet looking at just RVUs. A couple articles about changes in the APC system so you can get a little technical and historic perspective. An article about what should incentives be for doctors comparing facility and professional fees. And an article, what's the basics of the RVU system for those of you who want to read that. And I think I've got uh, two to three minutes left for a question or two and then to stay on time, we'll move on to the next speaker and there'll be a general Q&A session at the end. Thank you. We have the first question, and let me hold off till Momin gets to you with the microphone because we are recording this. Where session. is the first question? There we go. I have a question about let's say we do EBUS um, between somebody, some people do it under moderate sedation versus general anesthesia. How is the billing for that? How the billing from your perspective is no different. If someone is providing general anesthesia, then they get to bill for it. If someone else is providing either moderate sedation or monitored anesthesia care while you're performing the bronchoscopy, your billing is no different. If you are performing the moderate sedation, that is bundled into your bronchoscopy. At some point in the future, time uncertain, that is likely to change, but there's a whole lot going on right now with GI endoscopy, moderate sedation, and how that will all play out over the next 15 months is uncertain. Nothing will change until January 1 of 2017 at the earliest. It's a very good question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, a follow-up on that. Your professional fee doesn't get affected, but doesn't it eat from the technical fee because there's an, an extra anesthesia technical fee? Correct. And so the hospital gets to bill additional technical fees if it's provided in the outpatient hospital setting or in the ambulatory surgery center. Hi, uh, I just had a quick question. Um, as far as, you know, uh, office billing, uh, you said, you know, two and a half to three times of the allowable charges. I mean, what is the basis for that multiplier? You said, uh, most people do two and a half to three times. I mean, other than, uh, I mean, so the basis, yeah. so the basis for that is experience. There is some variation around the country based on, again, prevailing market conditions. There are some places in the country where based on, uh, those conditions, namely uh, many doc uh, very few doctors and large number of payers, contracted rates may be 200, 250, 300 percent of Medicare. Uh, in contrast, in the Delaware Valley where I'm from, two major payers have about 70 percent to 80 percent of the non-Medicare market, so they've pummeled rates very low. Uh, the what? So, so that, that's the reason for so it. So what would prevent a provider or a, a somewhat unscrupulous group, perhaps, um, to say, well, you know, we're going to charge 10 times the Medicare rate because we're getting a percentage, especially if they're going to, if, if you have some payers that are paying you a percentage of whatever you charge, then... So if there's two doctors in the region and one's charging 10 times Medicare and one's charging three times Medicare and it's a payer who's new to the area and says, well, you know, I only need one pulmonologist. We don't have many patients here. They'll contract with the lower one, but not with the so more expensive mar one. Force. If you're in a monopoly situation where you're the only pulmonologist for 175 miles around and you're the only one in town, I can't tell you that... 10 times Medicare is going to exceed the charges for them to send a cab or a limo to 
move that patient 150 miles for their bronchoscopy. But it's about free market conditions. One more question. You know, uh, when uh, EUS and EBUS is done by a single operator, yes. so is one added as a, you know, is it all bundled as one or? No, so you would be billing two separate charge, well, you would be billing sev several separate things. You would be billing your series of appropriate bronchoscopy codes, including endobronchial ultrasound, and then you would bill the esophagoscopy with ultrasound code as well. And that would be subject to a, potentially subject to a multiple payment procedure reduction. Depends on your contract. Thanks. Actually, I have a quick question that came up yesterday. Um, I think I know the answer, but I need your expert opinion. <laughs> if you do two separate procedures, a uh, chest tube or thrustentesis plus bronchoscopy, those two payments should not be affecting each other. The bronchoscopy will not be affected by a thoracentesis or a chest tube on the same day, but a thoracentesis and a chest tube as two procedures on the same day would be affected by the multiple payment procedure reduction because they're in the same family of services. Even for the professional fee? Uh, correct. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. We appreciate Thank you. it.